That was wonderful. I, I, I was transported to glory. I just want to be with you. Thanks, Jasmine, for organizing. The young people are taking over, and I'm glad. And so we should. Um, I think Jesse started off by talking about um, singleness and purity, a powerful message. And I didn't know that Pastor Jesse was an actor. Hey, Joey. You, you can't remember the story that he told. And then our evangelist, traveling preacher, broadcaster, elder, Neil, um, talked about um, the salvation method of conflict resolution. Wasn't it a powerful message? Indeed it was. And then um, I talked about um, narcissism and, and how to deal with a narcissist. The gist of what I was talking about. Um, Pastor Jesse said you should run and I did say you should run too. So I hope you have run. And last week, um, John, Elder John, preached a very powerful message about uh, mental health, didn't he? Yes. Story of Elijah and the, the boy and the mother and the father. And he looked at the different reactions of mother, father. It was a very, uh, I wasn't supposed to be preaching, but the preacher fell ill. And so um, I'm going to talk about worship in, in light of the whole family dynamics. It wasn't supposed to be, it was supposed to be how much is too much. Um, I would need a lot of time to write something on, on, that, on that scale. So I just jumped in with a message that I preached last week in West Croydon about um, stand up rather than stooping down. Stand with me. Let's read Daniel chapter 3. Um, and we'll go from 28, whatever version you have, it doesn't matter, just read with me. Um, Daniel chapter 3, 28 to 30. Um, let's go then, let's read together. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, who had sent his angel and delivered his servant that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yield their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amidst against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there's no other God that can deliver after this sort. In verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach. Lord, speak today. Amen. So Babylon was not a place for, for families, for Christian families, for Jewish boys. Especially if you are immature. This this was a place where you had to quickly find yourself, find your strength, and find your faith. Hello, Sister Beverly. Nice to see you. And Myron and Karina. Congratulations. I, I, I did say to you both that I must be at the blessing, even if I have to gate crash. You had to grow up quickly and be a man. You had to, in Babylon, you had to be able to live and survive in Babylon. If you were in Babylon, you had to adapt to the hostile environment without losing what you believe. Otherwise, you'll be blown away, blown away with many and any winds of doctrines or new ideas that come your way. Because you see, when you live in Babylon, there was always something new, some new ideas. <laughs> in Babylon, there was always some new lifestyle to adapt to. In Babylon, there was always some new beliefs to embrace. Isn't, doesn't this look like we're living in Babylon in our present days? Babylon was on friendly territory for anyone who believed in an absolute God. 
a God who reigns and who controls the wind and rain, a God who was supreme and, and sovereign. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew, how, knew that to survive in Babylon, they had to live close to God, and they had to have God close to them. Follow me this morning. I'm going somewhere. They knew that each day they, they wake up and, and live, they, they would face new and different challenges, trials and tribulation. They knew that yesterday's prayer, yesterday's church service was not sufficient for today's trials. They need fresh bread each day. They knew that their continued survival and existence had nothing to do with their skills, their knowledge, their wisdom, their abilities. They knew that to survive, not just as an individual, but as a family, they need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. They knew that the hand of God was guiding and controlling their destiny. Understand this morning that Babylon was a fierce country. They had a vicious, ruthless army. They were always looking for new territories to ravish, to destroy. Looking for new boys and girls to take back to Babylon. Understand, Babylon was into deporting, deculturing, and destroying. These Hebrew boys were chosen by their captors because of their physical structure, good looks, and exceptional brains. Maybe I would have been left behind. I don't know. Neil would have gone. Maybe Pete would have gone too. Perhaps David would have stayed. But anyway, the writer of Daniel in Daniel 1, 4 describes the boys in this way. He says, children in whom was no blemish, Daniel 1, 4, but well favored and skillful in all what? Wisdom and cunning in knowledge, understanding science and as such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. So the king was always trying to take the best of the best. And notice when Satan comes into the church. Talk to me, somebody. When he comes into the family, he attacks us with the strongest. Are we together this morning? If I ask you the question, what were the names of the Hebrew boys? You wouldn't know because you call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, every chosen captor would undergo three years of intensive training in Babylonian college. Their taste bud had to adopt to the Babylonian cuisine. They had to master the B Babylonian system of governance. They were trained to become conversant in their dialect and language. At the end of their three years of study in Babylonian university, they would matriculate and, and they would forget who they were. If I ask you what their names were, most of you won't even know because you call them Shadrach. That's what the Babylonian wanted. They wanted to change their dress style. They wanted to change their eating habits. They, would look, they, would, they wanted to think, live, and be called by their Babylonian names. If I ask you the question, some of you are looking at me strange. What are their names? I know we'd have some righteous members in this church. <laughs> to, mat, to modify these boys' mind, to modify their minds, their names were changed from Hebrew to Babylonian. As a matter of fact, even Daniel's name was linked to a Babylonian god. Because the king of Babylon wanted them to forget who their god was. Truthfully, many of us, many of us would be challenged to maintain our former lifestyle if we were upgraded to live in comfort whilst in captivity. Many of us are immigrants. We have traveled from our country and we have come to Britain. We have been upgraded and our Christianity has been downgraded. Right, 
Many of us, when, we, when our feet touch our homeland, we dress differently. We remove these things from all the nails because we're going to our home church. The length of the dress goes down. For some of us, the hat comes off and it goes on because we're home. Go oh, talk to me, church. We're home and we want them to believe that we have maintained that which we were taught when we were home. Many of us would be challenged to maintain our former lifestyle if we were upgraded to live in comfort whilst in captivity. Honestly, we would struggle not to enjoy the Babylonian luxuries. Frankly, some of us would do one thing in public and another thing in private. Maybe a part-time sinner, sometimes saint routine, who would want to, who'd want to lose Babylonian perks? Not so with these boys from the jump. They were not embarrassed to be different. They were not ashamed to stand up. They were not uncomfortable to be peculiar. As Hebrew boys, the Bible says that they purposed in their hearts, follow my journey this morning, that they will not defile themselves with the king's meat. But when you break down the Hebrew, it wasn't just about what they were eating. It was also their thinking and their dressing. Their lifestyle would always be maintained by what they knew when they knew God. Come on, somebody. They purposed in their hearts not to defile themselves by the king's food, even though they were living in the king's palace. If, if these practices, habits, and, and lifestyle go against the law of God, they, 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 they maintain that they would stand with God no matter what. The boy understood that any form of compromise, any form of concession, any form of acknowledgement to the Babylonian system would weaken and damage their relationship and connection with God. Once you start to hitch your lorry to the Babylonian system, I'm telling you, you will lose connection with God. They understood that their faith was not a seasonal experience. On off thing. They to be faithful, your heart has to be bounded to the will of God by the Spirit of God. When you're faithful to God, you make yourself vulnerable. Listen to me this morning. When you are faithful to God, you make yourself what? Vulnerable. You're exposing yourself to be messed up by the devil. Hello, somebody. Your life becomes an open book. Your expectations heighten. Your faith grows. And the more you expose who you are as a child of God, is the more messed up the devil wants to make you. Being an Adventist is a risky business in this present age and time. Being an Adventist means that you have to let go of these liberal ideas and liberal values that are flying all around you. Eyes are watching your every movement. Ears are listening to your every mannerism. Tongues are evaluating your every motive. Standing on the plain of Dura, Facing the image was no real challenge, listen to me this morning, was no real challenge for these three boys. Their conviction was already made before they stood on the plain of Dura. They had seen God in, this, in their past life. They had seen his faithfulness. They understood that God had stood up for them in the past. And if God stands for you in the past, he will stand for you in the present. God had showed up in their past circumstances. God had changed their situation. So Mishael, Azariah, and Ananiah, who the Babylonians called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had a Jewish mindset, even though they were living in a Babylonian world. Jesus said these words, be in the world, come on church, but not 
of the world. Paul puts it, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I live, but what? Christ that lives in... Listen, the boys had a history with God. They knew, I'm going somewhere, that true worship, listen to me carefully, true worship is a valuing or a treasuring of anything that belongs to God. Hear what the Bible says in Romans 12, verse 1. You know it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, come on now, by the what? Mercies of God that you present your what? Bodies as living what? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your... Yes, this is all about worship. We worship, when we worship God, God renews us. When we worship God, God refreshes us. When we worship God, God refills us. Daniel chapter 3, 4 to 6, go there. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and language. Is it there? Read with me. That, that at what time you hear the what? The sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the... I don't even know what a sackbut is, but it's something. A dulcimer. And all kinds of what? Music he what? Fall down and what? Worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had what? And whoso fall not down and worship shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Read the text. It talks about people. Read the text. Place and occasion. The text tells us the event happened on the plain of Dura, an open field. It was a beautiful place. A flat plain where people from all quarters of Babylon could see a prominent, colossal image. An image of gold. What an ugly sight. But a beautiful image. The occasion was to bow, bow, worship. The image was 90 feet or 27 meters tall. I'm five foot six and a half inches. Divide that by 90, you imagine how tall the image was. An image of pure, solid gold. And a giant image, close to, it was close to the king's heart. A statue golden built to, to boast of his power, his might. And, and so he called all his subordinates to worship. He decreed a terrible punishment, a fiery death to those who refused. Notice the text. Read when you have time. Everybody was there. People of wealth and power. People of all class. The sheriff, the governor. Everyone was there. People such as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what he didn't understand, that these boys were people of faith and prayer. They were people who walked with God, people who had survived the onslaught of the Babylonian embarment, people who knew that God had delivered the Jews from Egypt by the opening of the Red Sea, people like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who knew that it was at the sound of the shout that the walls of Babylon came tumbling down. People who knew that God was still on the plain of Dura even though the image was there. The boys were there out of politeness. Listen to me this morning. As they, like, as they were like all dignitaries summoned to be there. Let me remind you and myself, true Christian strength and faith is not seen when much is going well, but rather when our backs is against the wall. Talk is cheap. I could claim to be the greatest singer in the world, but once I open my mouth, you figure I can't even sing as I said I can. The same goes for members of this church. You can use all the right words, but if your actions don't line up with those words, we are fake. The text shows us an ugly sight, a sight of an image built by one man's pride, a sight to humiliate God and demean him, a sight to indulge one man's arrogance and to boost his ego. He had a fixed mindset, a mindset that he should be worshipped. This was his time, his moment, his occasion, a moment to belittle and diminish the king of the universe and occasions to take on the God of gods and the king of kings, but he forgot that there were three boys standing there. Nebuchadnezzar, dead image, was his way to call in others to worship him. Friends, we are born to worship. 
born to give God worship, born to glorify God, born to give him praise, born to give him obedience, born to give him thanksgiving, born to honor, to do, to reverence. You and I, we were born to worship God. By the way, the image on the plain of Dura was carried by the king's emissaries. The text doesn't tell us who carried them. It was placed there by the king's diktat, waiting to be worshipped, waiting to be adored. It just sat there unable to be moved. It just sat there waiting to receive what it does not deserve. There are many in some churches, not Croydon Church, who must be carried. Let me go gentle on this one. There are many in some churches, not in Croydon Church, who must be carried. Like this image, they cannot be moved. They must be carried. Some people don't make any contribution, though they're through their presence, their sacrifices, or their offerings. Uh, they must be carried. Um, some of us, we only have our names on the church rolls, and the only time people know us is when our funeral is announced. We don't sing on the praise team, attend prayer meetings, help in the food bank, or any special occasion. We are just carried. Don't help but hinder some members. Don't serve but wait to be served hand and foot. Don't lift but like to be lifted up. Some of us, we're immobilized, deactivated, disabled. We're out of action. Um, we're living off the gifts, the prayer, the praise, and the sacrifice of others. Some members in the church, they just love to be carried. I didn't expect an amen. Some of us, we come to church, we like to be carried. We're spiritually lame and spiritually weak. No song from the choir can stimulate us. No sermon from the pulpit can motivate us. No scripture can inspire us. No revival can reform us. No prayer can change us. No speech can uplift us. Even though the church is fully decorated, latest technology, we come to church well-dressed, looking good. We come, but we come without the presence and the power of God. We need God. We need God in God's house. We need God in God's place. When I walk into the church of God, I must feel the presence of God in God's house. And if you walk into this place and you don't feel the presence of God, the question is, what are we doing in the house of God? We need an anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We cannot do God's work without being spiritual. Spiritual work requires spiritual People, you have to be under the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You cannot stand up for God without knowing God. You cannot preach Jesus without the anointing. You're lame, I'm lame, we're all lame. Until as a church, we are spiritually healed. Until as a church, we're Holy Ghost filled, fully committed. Until we are fired up by the power of the Holy Ghost. The church will always remain a dead and a dry place. If you want to be worshipped, and some of us in this church, we want to be worshipped. But if you want to be worshipped, you've, you've got to be God. If you want my worship, you've got to be able to make something out of nothing. If you want to be worshipped, you have to be able to die on the cross and save me from my sin. Worship belongs to God. He's the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer of all things. Paul says, in him we live. We move and have our beings. The time has come in the church of God that those who are being carried should get up and start doing something for Jesus. Understand, it was an ugly sight that day on the plain of Dura, the king sat in his royal chair giving the command. The people waited for the music to bow down and worship. An immobile statue carried by the king's emissary 
sat on the plain waiting to be worshipped. Daniel chapter 3, 13. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 3, waiting to be an image, waiting to be worshipped. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage, read with me, and we were commanded to bring who? Shadrach, Meshach. Then they brought these men before the king. The king spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not what? Serve my God, now worship the which I have. Now, let us see. The Hebrew boys understood that church doesn't happen in the building. It happened outside. Can I say that again? Who you are is not displayed here in your three-piece suit and your Saturday best. It happens outside. The church is a filling station. You come to be gassed up. You come to be filled up. And if you're an electric vehicle, you come to be charged up. The church prepares you so when you go outside, you can face the challenges and the trial. Church happens not inside your house, even though it does. Sorry, inside the church. But it happens when you stand on the plain of Dura, the king gives his command, the music plays, and the knees start bowing to golden image, and you're standing up when others are going down. This is when church becomes real. This is when faith is tested. This is when your allegiance is known. The importance of worship is huge. So when these boys were called to bow down, they stood up. When they were called to compromise, they stood up. When they were called to be like others, they stood up. Often, we allow distractions to get in the way. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing, young people and adults. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. It doesn't matter. You're a child of God. The church, the Adventist church, is retreating on major issues. We're silent because we don't want to be identified. We are retreating on issues. We don't want to make a statement on issues. Muslims are not afraid to speak their minds about what they believe. And we bash the Catholic church but they stand up and tell you what they believe. Not afraid. Secularism is on the rise. Woke culture is taking over. And the church is standing on the plain of Dura. Silent. Some might say, if you don't speak, you agree. We have a mission to accomplish. We have a truth to share. We have a God to celebrate. People do not know us until they see us. They don't know who we are until we declare our worship. Our worship declares our lifestyle and our loyalty. Many, much, of, much happens in the church, but that's not where God sees you as a Christian when you step outside of the walls of this church. How do people see us? Too many of us come to Croydon Church to be entertained, to be excited, to have our personal feelings massage. Then on the other hand, some of us come here because we think it's a funeral home. So anybody else express joy as to what God has done for them. We have to look around and wonder, why are they expressing? Listen to me, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, I don't care who is watching, who is looking, who wants to say anything because you don't know my journey. Amen. This is not your church. This is not my church. We might have built the building, we might have paid for it, but this is the house of God. And so when the children of God comes into the house of God, they should be able to express 
the goodness of God in God's presence because let me tell you something my friends the Bible says that we must enter his courts come on church with praise don't be afraid to shout when God is speaking to your heart this is not a funeral home it is important that we take worship seriously worship matters worship matters to God it should matter to you sometimes we come to church but we don't worship we sing songs but we don't worship we listen to sermons but we don't worship we serve in ministry but we don't worship worship is a lifestyle it is the gathering of believers to practice and to celebrate God we are created the Bible says that we were created in the image of God as such we are bearers of his image we are designed to be in constant communion with the Father Son and Holy Spirit notice the Bible says that when the angels stood in the presence of God um, they sing what holy somebody says one for the Father holy one for the Son and for those who don't believe in the Holy Spirit holy one for the Holy Spirit worship is a lifestyle it is in our DNA it is built into our human nature worship worship and when you listen to me this point write this down when you truly worship you learn how to love difficult people Not only that, but it gives you the power to stand before kings and prime ministers and politicians and police and declare that we serve a risen savior. It allows us not just to look on those who are influential and those who have power, but it allows me to go and mingle with those who have nothing. To sit with those who are sitting on the pain and the poor and the pauper in society. We are emissaries of God's grace. His grace, we're ambassadors. We're called to spread his message. So each time we come to church and we worship, then worship should spill over from the church into the streets. It should spill over into the shops, into the workplace, into the hospitals, into the parliament, into our homes, onto the plain of Dura. Let me tell you something. The Bible says when Moses came down from the mountain and he faced the people, he said, veil your face, what's happening? Moses declared, I have been in the presence of the Almighty God. We are to become channel of grace, hope bringers, joy restorers. We are to look at people and we need to see their needs. We need to empathize with those who are pain. We need to support those who are having troubles. Pardon the prisoners. Be, be the sight of the blind. We need to lift the burdens of those who are battered, bruised, and beaten. Worship connects us to God and God connects us to others. These three boys could have compromised they could have just bow they could have slightly bow they could have just rationalized just this one time they could have temporarily disassociated themselves from God like some of us like to it's just for this moment God wants us to change the world he wants us to be his mouthpiece God wants us to hook up with the power of the Holy Spirit these boys could have Compromise. They could have been like Aaron and says, right, the people want an image. So let's give them an image. They could be like Saul who says to obey, to, um, let me take the best to sacrifice. They could have been like Samson. I, 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 Di, Delilah, please let me. Well, they could have acted like Balaam, the prophet. Just this once, I'll take the money. When we... When we compromise, write this down, we give up something that is most valuable for something that has no value. Let me say this again. When you compromise, you're giving up something that is most valuable for something that has no value. We must never compromise our faith. 
We must never compromise our belief, never compromise our values. We must be diligent in our pursuit of God and His truth. We must resist the temptation to conform to the image of this world. The world is in danger, and the church stands on the plain of Dura, compromising. Look at the boys. Come with me. Look at the boys. Standing up, standing tall before the king. Look at the boys speaking to the king. Look at the boys being courteous but strong. Life, life is in danger, but not afraid of up upending consequences. Oh king, listen to the word. Oh king, we are not careful to answer thee. We won't bow to your image. We won't serve your God. We only serve God. When the church truly serve God, help is on the way. When the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, life is transformed. When the church worships, you see the beauty and the glory of God. When the church worships, help is on the way. We receive something. We hear something. We feel something. We feel the power and the moving of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know God, that God still blesses, God still heals, God still restores, God still transforms, God still raises from the dead, God still opens doors, you just need to learn how to truly worship God. Songwriter says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my dispelling cry from the waters, lifted me now, safe I am. Love lifted me. When you worship God, he lifts you. Let me put the sermon to bed. Church happens not in the building, but when you're standing on the plain of Dura, the king gives his command, the music plays and the knees bow to the golden statue, but you're standing up when others are going down. The three Hebrew boys stood up and they stood out. God has a way of showing up. He has a way of going beyond our expectation, going beyond what he expected, opening doors that we thought we're closed. Let me tell you something. I've asked God for bread and he gives me a bakery. I've, got, I've asked God for physical restoration. Instead, he forgives me of my sins. I've asked him for a house, but he said to me that he's building me a what? A mansion. I asked him for healing and what he does instead, he sends you resurrection. God is able to do abundantly above and beyond that which we ask, we think, or that which we imagine. God has no limits. Daniel 3, my last verse. If it be so, this is the message. Take this with you. Daniel 3, if it be so, let's go. Our God whom we is able from the burning fiery furnace and he will what? Out of thine hands, O king. Verse 18. But if, but if not, let us no, no, king, that we will not what? Now worship the golden image which thou hast what? In this statement, are, in this verse are three statements. A statement of faith, a statement of character, and a statement of anticipation. We won't serve any other God. That's a statement of faith. We don't care what happens to us. It's, it's a statement of character. And God will deliver us is a statement of anticipation. But if not, King, and many of us, we're living not in the but if not phase, but in the phase that God will deliver us. But if not, remind me of Jesus, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. It summarizes their faith and trust in God. It declares that worship is not a moment but a lifestyle that shows your character. Somehow the statement suggests that the boys were anticipating something great for God. King, we believe that God will deliver us from the fiery furnace, but if not, we will not bow. They didn't want to die, but they didn't want to be disappointed. And if not... He is still the King Most High. And if not, He still loves us. And if not, He still will rescue us. But most of us are living in this world that I'm praying, I've been praying for years. My life is becoming a living hell. I've been praying, but God is not delivering. If God rescues you from the flame, He's good. But if not, He's still good. 
Although the earth quakes and the mountains be thrust in the sea, my life, I will not fear nor be moved because God is still God. Though they slay me, yet will I trust him. I will state plainly, I know my Redeemer lives. My God is able to heal me of my sickness. But if not, I will not forsake my faith. Even though my disability will never be fixed, I, I, I will still trust God. Even though my marriage is breaking apart, I've been praying and the Lord is not listening, I will stink, still cling to him. I will still, still cling to my vows. Even though my child is not listening and I'm praying and, and I'm begging God, I'm saying, God, help me with this child. Nothing is happening. But if not... I'm still going to worship God. Even though the church seems not to like me and people treat me bad, my faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. As an Adventist Christian, we need to begin to move away from the Lord will deliver us stage and step into the but if not, if my bills are climbing, I'm still going to trust God. If the church is failing, I'm still going to trust God. Whatever kingdom you're on, there's a kingdom that will crush the, this kingdom forever. There's no one thing, no place. There's nothing beyond the limits of God. Nebuchadnezzar said, who is this God who can deliver you from this fiery furnace let me tell you I have a God who is able to deliver not in the name of the church not in the name of an elder not in my name but in the name of God in his name we can see the invisible in his name we can do the impossible your life can be transformed in his name burdens can be lifted problems can be solved sickness can be healed Death can be cancelled. In his name, your ugly life can become beautiful. Troubles can be conquered. Hearts can be cleansed. Sins can be forgiven. But if not, I will not bow. God, you can rescue me from all the problems I'm having in my family. You can rescue me from all the problems I'm having in the workplace. You can rescue me from the problems I'm having in church. But if not, I'm still holding on. The king wanted the boys to bow. Read the text instead. He was bowing. He wanted the boys to be burnt up. Instead, the boys were walking around in the midst of the fiery furnace. You know why? He made a mistake. The Bible says he heated the fire seven times hotter. The sign of God. He has a way of moving when things come into seven. I don't know about your life today. I don't know what fiery furnace you're going through. God will show up. Notice in the text, when you have time, read it. When he showed up, the only thing that got singed was the things that they put on the boy. Read the text. The Bible says, he started out by saying, who is that God? Then he says, your God. And by the end, he says, my God. When you stand up for God, God shows up for you.